hear more and more of my story, you, you, I will tell you more of my story. How I, I grew up in Brazil, uh, I was raised in a family who was an animist. Animism is the type of faith that believes in spirits, in demons, and different types of entities. And I grew up in that faith, but at around 14, 15 years old, I was baptized into the Christian faith, accepted Jesus, and wanted to become a pastor. So I began preparing myself to be a pastor. I moved to the, a theological seminary in Brazil. I studied theology for two years, and then I thought, God wants me to learn more. God wants me to be a missionary abroad, and I need to learn English. So I go to England, and the reason why I went to England is because I wanted to learn English to become a missionary. In England, I became an atheist. It was in England that I completely lost my faith in anything that has to do with God or any faith, any religion at all. And at that point, I struggled and I began researching and researching. I studied existentialism, humanism, uh, uh, any type of ism you can imagine. All different philosophies, uh, Epicurean, Epicureanism, I mean, you name it. And uh, lo and behold, two years later, two and a half years later, God again brought me down to Christianity and showing that God is real. Our God is real. And I hope tonight, show it to you, why, at least one aspect of the reasons why I believe God is real. When we study Bible prophecy, friends, when we come to study the core of Bible prophecy, we can clearly see there is a supernatural power guiding the history of the earth. And tonight, I'm not trying to be preaching to you. My goal is to, to show you what God has accomplished and make you, in the end of tonight's message, at least you will be able to think, okay, I think maybe I should trust the Bible. I should give it a try. That's my goal tonight. I hope that we can accomplish together. Some of the ground rules that I always have when I present these messages, anywhere I go is the first one. Can we read this together? The Bible will what? Be the source of truth. That means that we'll study the Bible. I'm not going to pick up any Mayan calendar here. I'm not going to pick up any Nos Tradamus, although we may speak on them a little bit. But we want to find out the truth and compare it to nowadays. We'll be using the Bible. The second thing that I want you to know tonight that's very important, it's foundation for us, is that the Bible will do what? Interpret itself. That's very important because I do not want, just want to say, you know, that's what it is, but I'm telling you what I think it is. I want to show you that the Bible, when we study carefully, the Bible will interpret itself. Okay? So that's very, very important for us to start tonight. So, every time we look into the eyes of a child, we have to think to ourselves, does my child have a future? Every, and this is a picture was taken when Gabriel was only eight days. And as Helen and I look into his eyes, we wonder, will he have a good future in this world? Look at our world today. Let's, well, let's not talk about the world. Let's talk about just the United States of America. We have a great nation. We want to bless the world. And God has blessed America. But tell me, whether are you believing in, in politics, whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, Aren't we in trouble? Just think of this. No matter your party, we are in big trouble economically, financially, politically. Things are happening all around, and we wonder. Sometimes as a parent, you're leaving the home, you don't know if you're coming back. It's sad. So do we have hope for the future? Can we trust that our children, our grandchildren, or even us will have hope in a blessed future? Well. No matter how ugly things may look, how bad things may look, I want to know that there is hope. The Bible actually shows us hope. When we look into prophecy countdown, it's the countdown to great joy and amazing things God is preparing for us. Deuteronomy 29, can you read this together? Look what it says. It says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever mean that God has the secrets but what he wants to reveal it he will reveal unto his children and who are his children who are his children who are us we are his children so God wants to reveal to us what it is tonight we are going to study a Bible prophecy that to me as a former 
atheist, it's amazing. I mean, honestly, if you were an atheist and you look into this Bible prophecy, it is hard to really, really make another argument for this. You will see that we're going to study a Bible prophecy tonight that is over 2,500 years old and has predicted the history of the world, one empire from one another, down to our days. And I hope you will be able to understand it tonight and come to a conclusion that the Bible is true. We're going to travel back in time to the chambers, the room of the most powerful monarch of those days. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. Can you say that? Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, he was the king of Babylon, the most powerful monarch of all those days. And, and the story tells us in Daniel chapter 2 that, the, that, that this king, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. And he woke up in the middle of the night sweating and then he lost his sleep because he could not remember his dream, but he knew it was a bad dream. How many of you have ever had a bad dream and you woke up in the middle of the night? How many of you see your hands here, right? It's not fun, right? Isn't it to have a bad dream? I hate when that happens. But how many times you dream about something, you wake up, you know you will dream about something, but you can't remember what it was? Right? Have you guys been there? I've been there. So th this happened to this king. He had his dream and could not remember it. Look what it says, Daniel chapter 2. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that he slept. Did what? Left him. So he could not sleep. So as the most powerful monarch of those days, he woke up in the middle of the night. I can't get any sleep. Nobody will sleep tonight. He calls all his wise men, people of the, uh, of the court that were considered wise, and start asking each and every one of them, gather everybody here. And he sat on his throne and said, guys, I had a bad dream. And I can't remember what it was. So I want you all to tell me my dream and tell the interpretation of my dream. That's what he said. So the wise men of Babylon were like really, really concerned. And look what they says. Oh, live, oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the what? The dream and we will give you the interpretation. Now, do you see how smart they were? That, that's smart, isn't it? Oh, king. No. Tell us your dream, and then we will tell your the interpretation. Now think about this. If you want somebody, if you want to know that somebody really has a special connection with God, or to gods in this case, especially if they claim to have that, shouldn't they know the dream before the king told them? They should. You know, uh, w w my mom grew up uh, going, as I said, we believe in spirits and, and demons and things of the other different powers, and she, she went up going to uh, psychics and, and different people, and they were going to read her hands in the palm of her hand, and they would come to her and just look into her hand and says, Oh, I see somebody in your eyes. Mm. Isn't that smart, right? I, of course. Oh, do you see somebody? Oh, yes. And they ask, is there a man in your life? Uh, yes, there's a man in my life. Mm. I see love. Isn't that easy to picture? You know, I can guarantee you I'm not a psychic here, but I can get anybody here around and make you think that I, I know things about you. So things like this are simple and they're usually a fraud. And in this case here, they were a fraud. So the king was very smart. Look what he says here. No, 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 no. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The king was smart. said, I'm not going to tell you what I dream. I want to find out if you can guess my dream. So the wise men protested and it says, Lord, the king, there is no man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Nobody can do this. And they were right. No man on earth Nobody can get into your mind and, and know exactly what you're thinking right now. Nobody can do this. And they were right. The story tells us that this king was so angry and so angry that he says that everybody on that night, before the sun was going to be raising the horizon, everybody was going to die. 
all the wise men of Babylon were going to die, even those that were not in the king's chamber. So the soldiers started going around them and gathering them to kill them all and slaughter them together. And they come to a guy called Daniel. Daniel was a Jew. Not, he was not from Babylon. He lived in, in Israel, most likely Jerusalem. Babylon came to Jerusalem, sieged Jerusalem in the year 539 before Christ, and they took all the Israelites of the wealthiest families as slaves to Babylon. And when Daniel went to Babylon, he was probably about 15, 14, 16 years old. He was very young, away from his parents. And then he was called one of the wise men because he was a very smart young man. So they called him and said, hey, Daniel, tough luck, man. You are going to die tonight. Can you imagine this? You know, somebody just knocking on the door. Sorry, the king had a bad dream. You're dying tonight. Can you imagine that? Right? It's a pretty tough place to be in yourself. Eh? So Daniel said, no, please, give me a break. So Daniel went before the king and it said, king, well, he sent a message to the king. Just give me some time. Just some time. Let me see what happens. And if I find out the dream, I will come and tell you the dream and interpretation. And the king allowed that. So Daniel went back to bed, went to sleep. And the Bible tells us that on that very night, God gave Daniel the answer. That's amazing. And, and, and look what Daniel did as soon as he discovered the answer. I want you guys to read this with me. What did he do? He says, I thank you and praise you. Whom? Who is? Oh God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and, and might. That's what he did. The first thing Daniel did, he went to praise God. That is amazing. He was just about 15, 16 years old little kid. Now he's taken before the most powerful monarch, a dictator, nobody today is compared to his power, because you have to be the wealthiest, the most powerful monarch, and a dictator all at the same time, and this little kid, about 15, 16 years old now, come and starts telling to the king, king, the wise man could not find out the dream, but everybody together, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the what? When? Once again, a lot of days. So he has shown to you, King, what is going to happen in the latter days. So, and I imagine at this point here, the king sitting on his throne and just, okay, what does this kid know? I really want to kill everybody. I messed up. I had a bad dream. I know this is bad bad omen for me. And now this little kid who wants to tell me something. I imagine maybe the king at first, you know, kind of, you know, underestimating little Daniel. But let me ask you this here. Are you guys ready to find out what the dream was? Let me see if you want to see the dream. You want to find out what the dream was? Oh, I got some hands. Are you curious? So this is what the dream was. He says, Oh, king, you, you were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent. It stood before you and its form was awesome. This is the image, okay? So this image's head was fine of, was made of what? Gold. Its chest made, and arms of? Silver. Its belly and thighs of? Bronze. Its legs of? Iron. Its feet partially of what? Iron and partially of? Clay. That is part of the dream, but the dream continues. Oh, king, you watched while a what? Stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. But it continues. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer thrashing floors, the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. But it continues, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was the dream. Now I imagine, again, the King Nebuchadnezzar sitting on his, at first sitting like, leaning back on his throne, okay, what does this kid know? But now, I imagine him 
Like, you know when you like, you start paying attention to something and you got, you're leaning towards your seat, right, Ellie, right? You know, you, you pay attention to that now and it's like, what is it saying? So I imagine the, the most powerful monarch in the whole world now paying attention on what he was saying. And yes, that's my dream. That's exactly what I dreamed. How can you know? And Daniel says, well, there is a God in heaven who can reveal dreams. That's the dream. Now, how many of you want to know what the dream means? Let me see your hands here. Let's see your... A few of you want to know, all right? So I'll tell for those who want to know and those who did not raise your hands, I know you want to know. So I'll tell it anyways. Let's take a look into what this dream means. Look what he says first, O king. Oh, you, O oh king, are king of kings. You are this, what? Head of gold. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. It says, you, the king, are this king. You are the head of gold. So again, the Bible is interpreting itself. I cannot come here and tell you that the, 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 the head of gold is Barack Obama, Donald Trump, or, or King Jong-un. I cannot do this. The Bible is saying that the, the head of gold is who? It's the king Nebuchadnezzar. So our deal is that the Bible will interpret itself. It's not me telling what it is. It's the Bible telling you what it is. And it true is that Babylon reigned all over the world, the known world at that time, uh, from, from especially this, area, this region in the world, touching part of parts of Africa, uh, parts of Iraq, Babylon today is in Iraq, used to be in a, uh, where Iraq was, and they reigned the, the apex, the summit of their power and kingdom, it was from 605 to 539 before Christ. We're looking almost 2700 years ago, and Babylon was indeed an empire of gold. If, if you study archaeology today, you will find out that Babylon, they had like many bricks, was built and covered and layered in gold almost everywhere is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world Babylon was indeed a luxurious it's it was an amazing amazing empire in, in those days it was one of the strongest cities empires of those days they have walls that people thought that could not be penetrated this I, it's a picture that I took in the, at the British Museum, this is actually you find in the Berlin Museum. It's a kind of a kind of a replica of the Babylonian walls. They look like they were covered in blue bricks and have images of animals. And primarily, we will study this in few nights. What? Does anybody see what this is? This is a a lion, and it has what? You may not be able to. It has wings. A winged lion was a symbol of Babylonian Empire, especially Nebuchadnezzar. In a few nights, you will understand why this is so important for Bible prophecy. This is amazing. I get goosebumps. Again, as a former atheist, looking to this, this is amazing. Again, this picture was taken at the British Museum uh, in London. But the dream does not end there. It says its chest and arms made of silver. So if the head of gold is the King Nebuchadnezzar, what would be the, 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 the chest of silver? It would be another another king or another kingdom. Is it me saying this? No. The Bible tells us in Daniel 2, 3, 9, it says, after you shall arise, what? Another kingdom, meaning the chest of silver. And you don't need to be a, a really smart person to find out if you study history, you will find out that after Babylon, they, there came one, pile, one empire that took over Babylon and, and overcame Babylon. And they were the Medes and the Persians. The history tells us that in 539 before Christ, uh, no longer King Nebuchadnezzar now, but the King Belshazzar, which people think he was uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, he was not really his grandson, he was the third after him, but he was called grandson because he was a king. He was a guy who liked partying. I mean, 
big time party. Like I'm talking about like you getting wasted party. So he threw up this party for everybody in the kingdom, made special food, and everybody started drinking and drinking, and everybody was getting like heavily drunk, especially on beer, because Babylonians, they are the ones who start making beers. Yes, that the, came from Babylon. Beers, that's where they start making it. They're experts in this. But the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 5 that on that night, they were celebrating and getting drunk, and suddenly a bloodless hand a star just appeared on the major walls of Babylon and wrote, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parsin, which means, many means, God has numbered your kingdom and did what? Finished it. So he, ha he said it twice. And then he said to Kel, which means you have been weighted in the balances and found what? Wanting. In other, in other words, you know what? Your days were numbered. You were found wanting. And now it's too late. Tough luck. Your kingdom will be given to someone else. That's what it said next. Pettis or Parsing says, Your kingdom is, everybody together, divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. On that same night, the history tells us that the, the, the one of the generals of the Medes and the Persian Empire together called Cyrus, they were very, very smart because Babylon had walls. They could not be penetrated. That's why they could afford to get drunk and hope that nobody would be able to get through the walls. But they did not notice that the Euphrates River ran right through the city. Cyrus diverted the river with his army, so it slowed down the flow of the water, they went through the river canal, and somebody on that night left the gates open. Somebody was drunk. Left the gates open through the waters. And one by one, the Medes and the Persians, the army went through Babylon when everybody was drunk at night. And guess what they did to the soldiers who were drunk? It killed them all, most of them. Babylon, here's, a, here's an import, important lesson for us. The most powerful in, in, empire of those days did not crumble to the ground because it was attacked really from outside. It was something that infiltrated the inside. The things that have the potential to destroy our lives may not be coming from outside. Sometimes we left little doors and they come from within and they destroy us from within. But here's the amazing thing again from a former atheist. The book of Isaiah, 150 years before Cyrus was ever born. Did you hear me? 150 years before Cyrus was even born, the book of Isaiah mentions his name and tells that he was going to take over Babylon. Look what he says, Isaiah 45, 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, speaking of Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Bible prophecy, again, this is amazing. One, can you imagine if you find your name in the Bible 150 years before you were born? Are you guys there with me? This is something. This is, this is really, really something. But the dream does not end there. So the first is the head of? Are you guys there with me? First the head of? Then the chest of? But now it says that another third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over the earth. So another kingdom will come and it was the, king, the kingdom of bronze. And history tells us, you can Google it. What was the kingdom that came after me, the Persia? It was the Greeks, especially with Alexander the Great. And they were known as the kingdom of, the, 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 the army of bronze. Their helmets were made of bronze, the armor were made of bronze, their, some of their shoes were made out of bronze. I just been to Greece and I bought a little helmet, a little tiny one of course, and again, it looked like bronze. And he's still like respect, highly respected in many parts of Greece. This is in Thessalonica, uh, northern Greece. I was there a few weeks ago and I took a picture with Alexander, uh, this is a, a, a statue of Alexander the Great. We'll talk more about him in a few 
in the next presentations, but he was only 33 years old when he died, but from 23 years old up to 33 years old, he conquered the known world of those days. Amazing feat. But we'll talk more about Bible prophecy. So far we have what? Babylon is the head of gold, middle project is the chest of silver, and Greece is the waist, the, the waist area of bronze. But we have more. The dream does not end there. And then after Greece, a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as what? Iron. So this is very important for us to understand. So history tells us, again, this is history. All you have to do is to check it out. After Greece, another empire came, and it was the Roman Empire. Hence, we have Greco-Roman world. And look what one of the historians, Edward Gibbon, it speaks of the Roman Empire. Look what he says. Uh, this is from The Decline of the Fall of the Roman Empire, a very good uh, book for those of you who like history. It says, the images of gold, silver, and... I mean, he's not a Christian, okay? He's not speaking from a Christian perspective. He's just speaking from a historian perspective. It says, the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the Roman Iron Monarchy of... Why iron? Well, because, because it, was this strong, it was really strong. Notice that it is like gold, silver, and brass. How many of you guys like the Olympic Games? How many of you guys have seen the Olympic Games, right? The first place, get, the first place gets what? The second gets what? The third gets bronze or red. So it, you see that the, the, the value of the metal decreases as it goes, but the hardness of the, of, of the material increases. So it reduces in value, but increases in power. So although Rome was not as wealthy as Babylon or Greece or Middle Persia, they were harder and stronger as, a, as an army. And they reigned the world supreme of the, of the known world from, uh, from the islands of, of Europe, uh, from the British islands there, all the way down to Sahara Desert, all the way down to the Euphrates River. Rome reigned supreme from 168 before Christ all the way down to 476 nowadays. So for almost 500 years, 500 years, the Romans took over the known world of those days, especially Europe. It was around the time of the Roman world that Jesus was born. Remember that? The story of Jesus being born? Right? That it was around the time of the Roman world that, that Jesus and Joseph and Mary, they had to flee to Egypt because there was a census being taken uh, and, uh, and one of the heralds, one of the Jew, Jewish kings wanted to kill the babies. They had to flee to Egypt. It, and Jesus died in the hands of the Roman soldiers. So Jesus was crucified, which was a form of um, capital punishment in the Roman world. Excuse me. I, I love water, so my throat gets dry here. But that's what they did. For many years, they, they really took over the world, again, from the, all the way from the Atlantic Ocean, almost down all the way to the Persian Gulf here. That's what they did. And for many years, people thought that they could never be broken down to pieces. Remember, Daniel spoke about this, about this here, almost 500 years before he ever happened. But has the dream ended? Uh, it's not done yet, right? But it continues. It says this now. It says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partially of potter's clay and partially of iron, the kingdom shall be what now? Shall be, say it again, Divided. It is very important for us. So, it's speaking of the feet of the statue is made out of clay and made out of iron, and is a divided kingdom. So, the Roman Empire, just like prophecy foretold, was never taken over by one major empire like the Medo Persians did, like the Greeks did, like the Romans did. And as a matter of fact, when you study history, you know that the way the Roman Empire was uh, demolished, it was by the barbarian tribes 
which eventually became the, the, the nations of, of, of Europe, especially Eastern, uh, Western Europe. You have the Franks, the Anglo-Saxons, the Ostrogoths, the Lombards, the Heroi, and, and, and there were so many, they began fighting within the Roman world and destroying slowly but surely. But they were kind of united, but they were also divided. After the Roman Empire, the, the world, especially Europe, was never going to be united ever again. I want you to pay attention to this. After the Roman Empire, Europe was never going to be fully united again. That's the Bible prophecy. And as the Bible predicted, guys, this happened down to the centuries. Look what he says here. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of man, but they will not what? Adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. It's so interesting that says they will mingle with the what? The what? Seed of man. Every time the Bible speaks of mingling with the seed of man or the seed, it's speaking of offspring. It's speaking of children. It's speaking of intermarriages. Now, if you like Europe and you study the history of Europe, you know it was very, very common for kings to intermarry so they could try to gain more power. A great example is Napoleon who divorced his wife Josephine and married uh, Louise of Austria, trying to gain more power and more influence in Europe. As you know, this was a total failure, his, his marriage and everything else. Again, why did it not work? The Bible says 2,700 years ago that they will mingle with the seed of man, but they will not what? Adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, was Napoleon the only one who tried to unite Europe under one power, one authority? No. Well, Charles V in history tried. We also have Charles the Main who tried. Uh, Napoleon, especially Napoleon, I, I love I love France and I love the this, the history behind the the French Revolution. But Napoleon really thought he was going to unite Europe. This is is an extract from his one of his journals, his his diaries. Everybody together, he says, there will be one Europe, there will be one currency, there will be one language, there will be one government over all Europe. That was his goal. And you know that he almost kind of accomplished it until he came to the Battle of Waterloo down in Belgium. And just around that time, he lost the battle. And after he lost the battle, this is reported what Napoleon said. God Almighty is the what? Too much for me. He underestimated. And why, did he, why was he saying this? There would be one power, one Europe, one government. Because everybody around the time knew the prophecies of Daniel. And they knew that Europe was going to be divided. And he says, no, 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 no. I don't believe in the Bible, of course. There was the French Revolution. It was all about the, the Enlightenment and leaving religion aside. So this is all bad stories here or good stories. doesn't matter. We are going to build our own thing. And amazingly, when everybody thought he was going to overcome, he lost. He was defeated. Why did it happen? Again, they will mingle with the seed of man but they will not adhere to one another. Friends, since, after, since 476 AD, Europe has never been united again the way it used to, not only Europe, but the, that part of the world there they, that goes all the way down to Sahara Desert, to the Persian Gulf, they have never been united again, just like iron and, and clay. Did anybody else try? Does anybody know this guy here? Didn't Hitler try? He did. He almost succeeded, and everybody thought he was going to succeed. He failed again. Stalin tried the same thing. Napoleon, Charlemagne, Charles V, Charlemagne, they all tried. Every single one of them tried to unite Europe, and they have all failed. As Bible prophecy said, they're never going to be united again. And you have to understand, he mentions the kingdoms. He was four. He was Babylon first, and then there would be Medo-Persia. There would be the Greeks. There would be the Romans. Four empires 
gold, silver, brass, and then iron, and then the kingdoms would be divided. And this is exactly what has happened. How many of you guys know this flag here? This is what? This is the, is the European Union. If you travel to Europe, you will see this flag. It's about the European Union. They say many voices, one. One people, they travel all around the countries that are part of the European Union. They have this flag along with the country's flag. And, and, and they try to do this. I, again, I think it's, I, I support unity. I support this big time. We will see a few presentations, a little, a little more detail about this prophecy here, about United Kingdoms here. Uh, but they have tried. They do have one money, one currency all over Europe. But they have different languages. And have you noticed today that Europe is united but is still divided? You know, we, uh, I, I just been to Greece. Greece is going through a very difficult financial strife. Uh, Italy, Portugal, is Spain right now. Catalonia wants to separate from Spain and have their own thing. Friends, prophecy is being fulfilled right before our eyes. Again, as a former atheist, I have to look into the evidence, I have to look into the data and really say there is something about this. What happened last year, I think it was June 15th, I think it was June 15th, maybe wrong, the, the, the famous Brexit, right? United Kingdom, England and uh, Scotland and, and Wales were taken along with it, they separated they rupture from the from the from the European Union, and everybody thought that was not going to happen. The things that are happening in the world today are clearly uh, signs that prophecy is being fulfilled right before our eyes. So I want to submit to you that I, let me ask let me before I submit to you let me ask a question: Are we living the days of Babylon? Are we living in the days of Middle Persia? Are we living in the days of Greeks, of Greece? No, not as an empire, right? Are we living in the days of Rome as an empire? So I'm submitting to you now that we are living at the feet of the statue. I mean, the time of the feet of the statue, which is pretty much the kingdoms of this world would be united, but they would be separated. Now, has the dream ended? The dream does not end like this. The dream ends with a rock coming and hitting the statue where? At the, at the feet. Not at the head, not at the chest, not at the legs. The stone hits at the feet, meaning that the time the stone will come, it will hit around the times of the feet. The stone that is coming, this next kingdom that is coming, it is stronger than iron. It is like a rock. And when it comes, you'll come just about the times that you and I are living now. And the good news is this, that the kingdom that is coming next is the kingdom of God. Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus is coming. And look what he says about this kingdom. You, wa you watch while a stone was cut out without what? Without what? Hence, this is not a human kingdom. It's not made out of a statue. It's not a sculpture. This is without human hands, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. And look what he says. And God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That is the next kingdom that is coming. And it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever and there and, and look what he says in revelation now this is the other book we'll be saying very carefully in our prophecy it says this and there were loud voices where in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our lord and of his of his christ and he shall reign forever and and ever so friends what I'm saying, again, as a former atheist, let's just look cold-blooded at the evidence. We have a literature written 2,700 years ago that describes 
accurately that after Babylon another kingdom would come and then another kingdom will come and then another kingdom will come and then after the fourth kingdom everybody will say oh then another kingdom will come no 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 it doesn't say that another kingdom will come after the fourth kingdom the world will be divided among kings and Bible prophecy was accurately fulfilled detail by detail so tonight I want to guarantee one thing here to you we are living in tough days we don't know the threats of North Korea we don't know the involvement of China of Russia around the world but one thing I can guarantee you one day all of the kingdoms of this world will become will become will be destroyed and become subdued to the kingdom of God and why is this so important let me ask you this have you noticed that we have like bad bad presidents around the world do you know any country that has a bad president let me see your hands here does anybody know a bad dictator I'm pretty sure you know several of them we are afraid of North Korea I personally think this guy is nuts but who knows what he can't do we have Russia we have China and we have so many we are living in the most dangerous places uh, of times we have could ever live w any of us now could be decimated with somebody just pressing one little tiny red button do you see how bad this is and if you linger a little bit especially tomorrow we'll see that there are bible prophecies says that jesus will come at a time that men could destroy the earth i'm going to show you tomorrow night this but you have to be here bible prophecies being fulfilled accurately but the good news is this you don't have to fear the kings of this world you don't have to fear the presence of this world whether you like the presence you have or don't or anywhere you come from because Bible tells us that one day the kingdom that will last forever will be the kingdom of God and in the kingdom of God let me just tell you a little bit I will tell you more in the future but in the kingdom of God there shall be no death can you imagine you not being afraid of dying? Your loved ones, you're never saying goodbye to them. In the kingdom of God, mothers will never lose children again. There will be no miscarriages. There will be no goodbyes. In the kingdom of God, the presidents, the kings of the earth cannot steal your retirement. Can you imagine a world that nobody steals, nobody lies? And everybody lives actually happily? And, and again, as a former atheist, I look into this and I think, you know, this sounds too good to be true. This sounds like a fairy tale. It's hard to believe. But here again, look my reasoning. Bible prophecy has been fulfilled one at a time so accurately to the dot. So everything so far has been fulfilled and makes sense. What are the chances that what has not been fulfilled yet is going to happen? If everything else has been fulfilled, you have to work with your reasoning. And friends, as a former atheist, my faith has never been humbler, but has never been stronger. I can tell you that I firmly believe that Jesus is coming. Look in the world today, tomorrow. The, to, to, tomorrow's message will be about the signs of the end. And if this does not really sink in, you got to be here tomorrow night because you will see there are so details about Bible prophecy that are irrefutable but we do live in a terrible world today I've been to places in the world where they you know what you call in, in America you call somebody if you're making less than twelve nineteen thousand dollars a year you're under the poverty line I've been to places that poverty